like was not very indicative of what was going to be on the test. Is this one going to be more closely like similar content? So the question is the content of the study guide, right. mock exam, going to be closer to the content? It's meant to be a study guide. So it's meant to point at, maybe I didn't do so well the first time, but it's meant to point you towards the types of questions we're going to have on the exam. Most of the exam questions, my intention is, and maybe I fail at this, and I, that's why I appreciate your feedback, is to have the things that we spend a lot of time working on in class and fail exercises and assignments from the manual be similar to, but not identical to types of questions that will be on the exam. So if you study those things, this time I've been more conscious about it. So it should be closer. But that said, I will always add a question or two that are difficult questions because I'm trying to separate A and B students or B and C students. So there will be some things you probably haven't seen before in class. It's asking you to take knowledge and adapt it into a new circumstance. So I do always put at least one question on that is novel. You've probably never seen before, that's what I'm looking for. What do you do with it? Other questions about the exam or about content? Okay, so that's a great place to start. So chromosome nomenclature through the cell cycle. I'm flexible on nomenclature except for you need to know what a sister chromatid means. So here's, here's the problem. At metaphase, we'll have something that looks like this, or depending on what part of metaphase, those two sister chromatids So this thing on the left, circled in blue, is one sister chromatid. The object on the right is a second sister chromatid. This is for a diploid organism at metaphase. What's a sister chromatid? If you described its physical structure, what kind of a molecule is a sister chromatid? What's another name for it? It's a, right, it's a pair of strands. It's a double helix. So sister chromatid equals double-stranded DNA, which is something we would normally refer to just in common language when we're talking with each other as a chromosome. It's a double helix. The only time when we don't refer to a double helix as a chromosome is during mitosis and meiosis. In other words, before synthesis stage, there would be two discrete double helices. So in this case, each of these lines in all of these figures is meant to represent a double helix. It's just faster to draw as a single line. So before synthesis, this thing is a chromosome. It's a double helix. There's this small window during the cell cycle after replication and before cell division that a double helix is referred to as a sister chromatid instead of a chromosome. So just during mitosis, just during meiosis. Any other time of the cell cycle, we would refer to a double helix as a chromosome. So I'm going to try my best not to accidentally go back and forth between those two terms. To be very specific about a chromosome is a double helix outside of mitosis or meiosis and after synthesis and before cell division, that same type of molecule, a double helix, is called a sister chromatid. I might accidentally slip up, and so might you, in calling one of those double helices at metaphase a chromosome. So that's why this is not going to be worth points on an exam. If you accidentally referred to a sister chromatid as a chromosome, I don't mind. But if I say, draw a sister chromatid, you should know what the definition of a sister chromatid is, which is simple. It's a double helix between synthesis and cell division. 
It's just nomenclature. Same molecule, chromosome, chromatid, double helix. It's just the point in the cell cycle that the chromosome nomenclature differs, changes. Yeah? Uh, this might be kind of a dumb question, but um, on the first question on the exam, the mock exam, yeah. there was, um, it said like. This is when I start getting sweaty. Uh, <laughs> it said. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Um, label each arrow according to the process occurring at that point. So. And I guess I didn't really know exactly what you were asking for. And then I didn't see that. Ah. Uh. Like you're, that's absolutely right. So the question is about question one on the mock exam. You're absolutely right. I forgot to label the arrows, even though I asked you to do that in the key. So the question was, what are these, what's happening? What's the process that's occurring as part of this arrow? So just based on what's drawn here, we have a single, what does this circle represent, do you think? It's a cell, okay, and let's see. It's oogenesis, female meiosis, so it's right after synthesis. So it's an oocyte that's about to go through the process of meiosis. So we go from one circle above the arrow to two circles below. So what's this process? The first division. Right, so yes. Uh, okay. So this is division one. And then we go from two circles, which, oh, by the way, this big one is what? Uh, that's the oocyte, and that smaller thing is the body. first peanut butter, polar body, first PB. <laughs> peanut butter. Oh, yeah. Where's the chocolate? And then after the second division, sorry, I just had a peanut butter cup before class, so I'm primed for chocolate. Um, so second division, division two, the biggest, o the biggest oocyte is the oocyte. We have the second polar body. And then in this case, I've drawn the first polar body after its second division. They're still called first polar bodies. There's just two of them. Ah, so quickly, just for review, what's the ploidy, or how many copies of every sister chromatid are going to be in the first polar body before the second division? Normally, not in this picture, but normal meiosis, two. two. So there'd be two copies of each chromosome in both the oocyte and the first polar body, which means that after that second division, two gets reduced to one in each of the resulting cells. That's normal meiosis. Of course, what, we're, what we've been talking about and what you'll probably see on the test is what happens when meiosis doesn't go according to plan, which is why it's important to know how it works normally so that you can hopefully identify problems in meiosis when chromosomes don't segregate, sort, into the different cells as we would expect they would. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Others? Yeah. Will we have any um, tables or graphs like the ones we've gone over in lecture? Tables. Um, like the ones from the papers about the alleles. So allele frequency tables, are you asking if I would provide them if I required you to use them or if there are questions on those sorts of topics? Are there questions on those sorts of topics? Should I answer the question? Yeah. Normally I don't answer the question if somebody specifically asks me about the content that's going to be on an exam. It's like giving it away. But yes, there will be because we spend a lot of time on that in class. So it's a good bet. What sort of graphs were you thinking about? You said charts, or you said tables and graphs. I was thinking about the ones with the, the crossing and the number, and the one with the uh, with meiosis and the number of uh, 
what do you call that? It was like the number of the the ploidy on um, the y-axis. Oh yeah, those might be on the exam too. Not not confirming, but yes, that would be a good thing to look over and study. It's kind of slow going. So I guess I'll interject a couple of points about the exam. Maybe that'll stimulate some discussion or interest. And I also want to tell you this before anybody decides that they're not getting anything out of this session and they leave. And if you know somebody who is not here, then tell them to look at the video capture so that they get this information too. Good news and other news about the exam. Given a lot of your feedback, which I totally understand and appreciate after the last exam, most of you, well, at least most of the people that responded, had some hesitation about using technology during the exam, switching back and forth between apps and so forth, and that's normal. So what I'm going to do for this exam, there's a catch, but what I'm going to do for this exam is I will provide a paper copy of the exam. So you can use your one, again, just one device, smartphone, tablet, laptop, to work on things, and you could write out the paper version if you want. So you don't have to complete it by annotating a PDF on your device. But the catch is, so good news so far, right? For those of you that wanted to be able to use your laptop or tablet separately and have a different thing to work on, paper copy, that's fine. I do still want you to submit it electronically, though, please. <coughs> so you can use a paper version. So what I'm going to ask you to do then, if you do choose to use the paper version on Wednesday, is to take a picture of every page and to attach those pictures to the Google Classroom assignment where the exam is sent out. So instead of sending back an annotated PDF, you can send me pictures of what you've done in handwriting on paper. I still want the paper copy turned in at the end, but it's just more efficient for grading for me to have digital versions of everything. That's the only reason I'm asking for the digital versions. So that's going to be a choice you can make on Wednesday. I'll bring enough paper copies for everybody you can use one or you can decide not to and do everything just on your device. Any questions about that? Yeah? If you don't submit it exactly before 150, is it not accepted? <laughs> Technically, I have to respond to that question as yes, it's not accepted after it's due, but there's some flexibility. But not much flexibility, just enough flexibility. You see what I'm getting at? Right? No one gets a free pass to turn it in like an hour later. But I understand that sometimes there are technical hiccups, and even though the Google Classroom thing says it has to be turned in at 150, if it's 151, maybe I assume that your clock is running slow and you accidentally submitted it a minute late. Or you had some technical issues taking pictures and attaching them all. So you should, I write the exam to be able to be completed in 50 minutes. If you take the full 50 minutes and then you want to attach the photos and turn it in, it should be okay. Don't cheat the system, though, please. It's meant to be fair to everybody, and I can try to reduce cheating. I can't prevent it entirely. Yeah? So my question is sort of about exam one. Was there, did you return it with feedback? I did not. So for okay. exam one, I didn't return with feedback. I returned with a score and the request that you compare questions that you had, answers of yours that you had questions about to the video key to see for yourself if you could figure out where you went astray. Okay. And if you didn't watch the video, that's OK. But I ask you to watch it first. And if you still have questions, to come see me, which I'm happy to do with anybody who wants feedback. I remember last time you said that sometimes if uh, everybody in the class struggled on a question, like from exam one, that it'll pop up again. Are we going to need to expect that on this ah. exam? Good question, no. So the question was for the recording, are questions that were highly missed or highly not completed entirely accurately on the first exam going to show up on the second exam? No. Each of the individual exams just covers that portion of the content. Sometimes it builds. For example, you might need to learn, know some vocabulary from the first exam, but I'm not quizzing or I'm not testing directly on that knowledge. It just is part of the class knowledge now, so it might build on. But I won't do that until the final. The final exam would be the place where I might pick like the most frequently missed question from every exam and write a new question with those topics in mind.
remember again that the exam is worth 15 points, which is 15% of the score, which is less than a letter grade, a letter grade being 20% of the total points in the class. So if you're getting a good score now and you got zero on this exam, you'd still be in A territory, in other words. Try not to make it too stressful. Other questions or concerns? Yeah. Um, the answer sheet for exam two, is it on YouTube? Do you just like the mock exam or yeah, the, the, mock the exam. fake exam? Yeah. yeah, the thing that we can be discussing now. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's on YouTube. Okay. There's a separate, I think I distributed, I must have distributed the URL at some point, but it's a separate YouTube channel from the lecture capture channel. There's one that's called Keys, Biology 102 Keys. It's in there. So all of the practice exam and exam keys will go into that, uh, not channel, uh, playlist. Mm -hmm. YouTube playlist. Yeah. Which question or which topic? On the mock exam? between lanes one, three, and four, um, kind of like the homozygous one on the right, I would expect that to be like a pi with the heavier molecular weight. So would okay. that this be an example of some other gene, like maybe same person with different genes or whatever? Okay. This is, I think I see where you're going with the question, so let me try to respond and then tell me if I'm doing a good job or not. So what I was thinking, well, a lot of the agarose gel electrophoresis we've talked about has had to do with either microsatellites, heterozygotes, someone who has two different chromosomes of different sizes. And we also talked a little bit about restriction digests. And in this case, in my mind anyway, in the setup of this analysis, that there are four different DNA samples from four different people, let's say people, and we're analyzing PCR products based on gel electrophoresis. So if you have a, an individual four who's homozygous, let's see, what's the, what's the marker sizes on this? You can make it whatever. Okay, I can make it whatever I want? Okay, let's say two, four, six, eight, who do we? Appreciate. Or, yeah, that would be nice. So let's say that's a five nucleotide band. So that would be an individual where between the two PCR primers, diagrammed as one-headed arrows, there's a total of five nucleotides, which is not something we would normally do in PCR. Normally primers are longer than two nucleotides. So in, for example, that could be A, C, G, T, A. So you get a five nucleotide piece of DNA, you load that onto a gel. If this person has two chromosomes that are the same size, and you load that onto a gel, then both of those bands migrate at the same molecular weight. So how would you get somebody who has two different band sizes? They're heterozygous for a trait. Okay, so they're heterozygous. So instead of those two that were circled in black, let me add a longer version of the same chromosome that's, that are two different chromosomes circled in yellow here that are in a different individual. So they have one chromosome that's the same. It's a five nucleotide product. And we have a second chromosome that uses the same primer sequences by the way, I'm not, those letters in black are not the primer sequences. I'm just indicating that the sequences there are the same. But instead of just a G in between the primer sequences, there is, let's see, what I'm trying to make nine nucleotides. So I go from one G to, I have to add eight more. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
So now this individual's heterozygous. They've got a five nucleotide chromosome, and with the same PCR primers and the same PCR reaction, now we get a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen nucleotide product. Oh wait, I wanted nine, didn't I? Anyway, point being that the heterozygote means that you have, there we go, 13 nucleotides. Heterozygote, two different chromosomes, two different sizes, same PCR reaction produces two different bands from the same individual. If this is the setup, then I can't explain what's happening in gel well number one. I don't know how you get three bands from one person unless they're trisomic, maybe they've got an extra copy of a chromosome. And so you can use the same set of primer pairs, the same forward and reverse primer pairs, but you get three bands out of an individual instead of two. Or maybe this is to a gene that's been duplicated, and so there's a third copy of a gene somewhere in the genome. Yeah. Is it possible that they've added an enzyme that would snip it? Well, or yes. That not that's not part of this question. But that is another way to get three bands. We saw an example of that last week in class, where digest of one band, let me just generically draw this out. There could be an individual that's got two copies of chromosome, doesn't matter which chromosome, that one homologue has a restriction site at a particular region, and the other one doesn't because there's a mutation that abolishes that restriction site. So if you used PCR primers that amplify both of those chromosomes and make the same sized product, let's say that was 100 base pairs, if you added the restriction R enzyme, it would cut the top PCR products, anything that does have the restriction site, and maybe that's a 30 base pairs on the left side and 70 base pairs on the right side, if you loaded this whole mixture, the digested chromosome, with all of these chromosomes all together in one well on a gel, then you'd expect to see those three bands. You'd see a 30 base pair band. You'd see a 70 base pair band. Those are the two that should sum, and this is important, the sizes of the two fragments then should total whatever the size is of the undigested homologous chromosome. Right, 30 plus 70, those two fragments derived from the same sized piece of chromosome that just didn't have a restriction site. So 30 plus 70 should equal 100. If I asked, if I showed you a gel, now I love these questions because then I get good ideas for other exam questions, mm -hmm. which I hope does not mean you should not ask me questions during the review session. If we ran out minus enzyme and plus enzyme, that is without restriction digest and with restriction digest. And we had a molecular weight ladder that was 500, 400, 300, 200, 100. If without digest, there's a 400 base pair fragment, and with digest, you see 400 and 300. then can you tell me what other band you should see in the right-hand lane? See, this is like above. Let's say this is a heterozygote. One copy of the chromosome has a restriction site. One homologue does not. It would be? 100. In that sense, the idea would be that the 400 base pair fragment is the undigested fragment. And if you're seeing a 300 base pair piece of DNA, the only way to get 300 base pairs worth of DNA as a band is that there was a restriction site, and that means you should also see a 100 base pair product on the gel. If I was going to ask that sort of question, I would definitely have to tell you that this was restriction digest related. I'd have to mention that somewhere in the question. And I'd probably have to indicate that the individual is heterozygous, too. So 
So the question that I'm hearing, which is a reasonable question to ask, is up here, if you digest the top chromosome into a 30 base pair and a 70 base pair piece, my interpretation of the question is, would they stick back together? So this is a good advanced question because some restriction enzymes create differently sized overhangs. Those are called sticky ends because the chromosome was base paired with itself except for where the restriction enzyme cuts. If it makes this sort of staggered cut, then there would be hydrogen bonds here that are not bound to each other. They're broken. Those sticky ends are short enough, usually two base pairs or four base pairs, that you can't resolve quite accurately enough on an agarose gel difference between, say, 70 and 73 nucleotides in length. So I'm happy with everybody rounding if you're concerned about this sort of thing. Say 73, 72, sticky ends, close enough, just call it 70. If you're uncomfortable with that, just write on your exam. I'm assuming that this is or is not a sticky end restriction enzyme. It's not something we've talked about in class, so if all of that made no sense to you, you're fine to ignore it. Another thing that I'll often do to help with this is only consider blunt cutters because there are restriction enzymes that will cut without leaving sticky ends, and that makes the analysis a lot more simple. So if at any point you want to assume we're talking about a restriction enzyme that just cuts the same spot on both strands, that works too. And then you don't have to worry about these sorts of details. In reality, we do worry about these details, but here, not so much. Yeah? So you would have no, uh, like, like, say, it's like, you would give us a trick to me and they'd say, oh, is this a sticky end or a blunt end? Because I know they look different, right? Only they do look different. I won't ask that, though. I won't ask you to discriminate from a blunt cutter and a sticky cutter. Great terminology we have in genetics. Sticky ends. It's like what's happened after you're done eating peanut butter cups. <laughs> Sticky fingers. Okay, other questions? So five more minutes. I will be in my lab tomorrow morning from 8 until 10 or 8 until 11. I've got office hours at 11 to noon. So if you do want to come by, you might email me first. Not office hours. I'll definitely be there for office hours. But if you're interested in stopping by at any point during the morning, please email me and let me know, and I'll be sure to try to be around my lab at that point in time. Real quick, can we go to the, um, I forgot what the question is, but the one with the haplotype and the genotype, I'm still kind of like not so comfortable with it. Let's see. This one? Uh, seven. Question eight? Seven. Question seven. I think I've asked haplotypes on both, but. Let's see. Okay. So genotypes and haplotypes. This is a great question to, to finish on. Oh, and before anybody leaves, there's, other, there's one other piece of news I forgot until I just remembered. Exam. The biology department has required me to be at a meeting during the exam. So I've already asked some of you. In other words, I will be here at the start to distribute the paper copies, but then I have to leave. I've already asked some of you to check on each other and make sure no one has conversations and illegally collaborates during the exam. And on, Mon on Wednesday, at the start of the exam, I will ask for a volunteer to take the paper co collect the paper copies and take them back to the biology department office afterwards. So if you, if you have any questions about interpreting the exam questions during the exam, just write those questions down on the exam, and I will grade accordingly since you won't have me here to ask questions of actively during that 50 minutes. Okay. Analysis of haplotypes and genotypes. Semicolons and slashes. Four minutes. Two minutes per punctuation mark. What do the semicolons distinguish? First, actually, before I draw, before I answer that, 
and I, I apologize, I did not define, I think I overheard somebody talking about this before class. I drew some chromosomes that had circles on them, which I didn't define as being the positions of the centromeres, but that was, again, my fault. So let's say we've got some metacentrics or maybe submetacentrics, a couple of acrocentrics, or telocentrics, rather, and some small acrocentric chromosomes. So this is a diploid individual, two alleles of each chromosome. So chromosome one from mom, one from dad, two from mom, two from dad, three maternal, three paternal. Which chromosome do you want gene C to be on? One, two, or three? Okay, so we're going to put gene C. That's a, oh, I hate using capital and lowercase c's because they look the same. I shouldn't have done that. So here's C, capital C. Where do I draw capital, or the, the D genes? Which chromosome? So, um, three. One, two, or three? Three. three. Why three? Because the semicolons um, dis distinguish between which chromosome. Right. So semicolons <laughs> are the distinctions between different chromosomes. That is chromosome 1 versus chromosome 2 versus chromosome 3 versus chromosome X. The semicolons indicate differences, the distinctions of different homologs. The slash, on the other hand, is the maternal versus paternal. separates the paternal and the maternal homologs. So each of these, in other words, 1M and 1P are two alleles. They're two different versions of the same chromosome. They're two homologs, alleles, homologs. So if there's a capital C there, then somewhere on the same physical piece of DNA, there has to be a lowercase d. So that's one of the homologs. That's the maternal homolog on one side of the slash. It doesn't really matter. So what do I draw on the 3P? Capital C, lowercase d. Whatever's on the other side of the slash. That's a capital C, I promise. Lowercase d. These are both capital Cs. Okay. So then on chromosome 2, what do we have? There's a TA12 on 1. And it's okay. I didn't, except that parenthesis should be there. Unless you're told, unless I instruct you, unless there's other evidence, which we don't have yet, you don't know which copy that is 2M or 2P to put which allele on, there's no, nom there's no nomenclature for that. So you're free to choose whichever version 2M or 2P to put TA12 on and TA14. And then on chromosome 1, we have a capital B with a lowercase a and a capital B with an uppercase a. So here we've got a homozygous genotype, B, capital B slash capital B. We'd have a heterozygous genotype, capital A slash lowercase a. And that's the combination of the haplotypes and the genotypes together. Capital B, lowercase a from that piece of DNA, and capital B, capital A from that piece of DNA. Right, the second one is just the one gene, one alle one locus, not a gene, but one region of the chromosome. Yeah. So which one is a haplotype? So a haplotype will be anything that is a description of, that's an excellent question to end with. Feel free to go if you need to, but please stay quiet if you do go. The haplotype for a single chromosome would be, for example, capital B with a lowercase a. So anything that is on one side or the other side of the slash in reality, if I could ask about a haplotype that involves all three of these, that is, remember, haplotype formally is the combination of chromosomes that go together in a haploid gamete. So a true haplotype, for example, if we focused on the sperm, which is the paternal, chromosomes 1, 2, and 3, chromosome 1 would have a BA, capital B, capital A, chromosome 2, Paternal, right now I'm focusing just on the paternal alleles, would have a TA14. And chromosome 3 from paternal, from dad, has a capital C, lowercase d. So put, put together, yep, to close, 
How would you write that? It would be be a separating different homologs. So chromosome one is BA, chromosome two is TA14, chromosome three is CD. So looking back at the original question, that is the set of information that you had on one side of the slash on each different chromosome. There, there, and there. Thanks for coming and asking good questions. I'll see you briefly on Wednesday. This, this one? Yeah. Okay. Good question. Let's zoom in a little bit. So interpreting these tables, you'll see something like this on the exam. So what's the difference between these two tables? Top table, bottom table? <coughs> okay, one is, it's all in the title here. So one's African Americans in the US, one's Caucasians in the US. And each column like CSF1P0 here, the very left column, is the name of a microsatellite, a simple tandem repeat. It's, I don't remember which chromosome that's on. Let's say it's on chromosome 13. That means there's a particular part of chromosome 13 that's different in size between different individuals. That's microsatellite or simple tandem repeat, STR. And so some individuals might have, <coughs> say, five TAs, in a row, and other people, same chromosome, might have seven. So that would be in our nomenclature, TA parentheses, subscript seven. So in this case, we've got a TA5, TA7 heterozygote. So if that's true, what's the frequency of allele 7 in this population from this table? It's whatever this allele number in the leftmost column indicates. That number is just the number of repeats of whatever the microsatellite unit is. So in this case, TA. So TA7, if I'm not sure for that microsatellite for CSF1P0, I'm not actually sure it's a TA repeat, but that's not important. So there would be 0. Point, is that 6.3 or 5.3? Five, three? Five. 0. 0.053 frequency. What does that mean to us? In, in normal language, in non-genetic language, what does it mean if there's a frequency of CSF1P0 allele 7 in point, is 0.053? Uh, there is 5.3 percent of the percent chance that you'll find that trait on allele 7. Five, so 0.053 is a frequency. You can convert that into percentage, 5.3, by multiplying the frequency by 100. So frequency times 100 gives you percentage. So there's a 5.3 something. In this case, it's about that specific microsatellite. CSF1P0 has seven repeats in 5.3% of U.S. African Americans. That is, it, chromosomes. So in chromosome 13, in other words, 5.3% of chromosomes 13 have seven repeats. And here, allele 10.257 means that 25.7% of the chromosome 13s in U.S. African Americans have 10 repeats. In other words, if you took DNA from 500 US African Americans, abbreviating, that would be how many copies of chromosome 13? 500 individuals, how many copies of chromosome 13 per individual? One. There are different versions of chromosome 13. We're, what ploidy? 
humans. Yeah. Yeah, we're diploid. So there's two copies, two different versions, the maternal and the paternal allele of every chromosome in every person. So that's in 500 individuals, there are a thousand, maybe, definitely, a thousand different alleles versions of chromosome 13. So if 5.3% of those are repeat seven, that's how many people? 5.3% of 500. It's easier to do it with the alleles, 1,000. So 5.3% of 1,000 alleles is? 10. It's like, it's approximately a 20th. 0.05 is approximately a 20th or 5% of 1,000. What's 5% of 1,000? Rounding. It's 20, right? 5% of 1,000? Calculator, quick. 5% of 1,000. 10% of 1,000, and that's the way to do it. 10% of 1,000 is 100. Half of that is 50. Yes, thank you. 50. 5% of 1,000. I'm just waiting for somebody to tell me what the answer is. So that means that if you had that frequency, 0.053, seven repeats at CSF1P0, that if you looked in 500 people, each of which have two versions, the paternal and the maternal alleles of this chromosome, out of all of those chromosomes, you'd find 50 chromosomes that had that many repeats. So then the question, I guess, might be, how many repeats does everybody else have? That's 50 out of 1,000. What happens to the other, sorry, not people, chromosomes, what happened on the other 950 chromosomes? How many repeats do they have? Plus. Okay, so what, let's do eight then. Yeah, exactly, yeah. So if the frequency is 6%, then 6% 6 of the chromosomes in those 1,000 people would have an eight unit repeat. That'd be 60 chromosomes in this example. The most frequent version is allele 10. 25.7% of all of the chromosomes have 10 repeats. Plus. It's like it's one of those seasons where the temperature is changing and the allergens are out. Oh, sorry. You're, you're right. I misread that. Most frequent allele 12. Because I've been drawing all over my slides. Yeah. And all those in that column should add up to one. Ah, right? yes. Okay. But because these are frequencies or percentages, then they should total 100% when you sum all of the frequencies in one of those columns. If it doesn't, it means there's some missing data, which is okay. It might mean that there's one or a few alleles that are larger than 12 that just don't show up on this table, so those numbers aren't present. But most of these columns do total one. And if a number was missing from one of those columns, then you should be able to figure out what frequency or what percentage of chromosomes are missing data. So, for example, let's find a column that doesn't look like it sums to one, like D18 or D8S 179. If you take one and subtract those five numbers, that'll tell you what frequency, what percent of the numbers data are missing. That column definitely does not sum to one. It's got five numbers and the biggest one is 0.185. So there's some missing data there. And you could tell me what frequency of the data are missing. 
1 minus 0 0.012, minus 0 0.003, minus 0 0.101, and so forth. So if I said the only, the only other allele that was possible was 13, what's its frequency for that column? Right. So assuming that there's one additional allele beyond 12 and they just haven't told us. What would the answer be? I get a lot. I get 0 0.616 for this. That Almost 62% of data is missing from this column. That's just starting from one and subtracting the existing data, the numbers that are already in that column. So it could be that two-thirds of people have allele 13. It's just not shown on that table. Or two-thirds of chromosomes, at least. Other questions, good questions about this table. Are there any others about these sorts of allele frequency tables? Any cal questions about calculating combinations of frequencies? Which we've done a little bit of in class. How likely is it that you find a person out of certain combination of alleles. Ah, so number 11. Sounds good, let's do it. Clear this up a little bit so we can actually see again. So which table would you, let's use the top table. I, I mentioned in the video key that I didn't mention which of these two tables I wanted you to use to solve this. So I presented two different answers in the key. Let's just use the top table. So how do you attack this problem? How many different combinations of alleles at two different STRs can there be? How many different alleles of CSF 1P0 are there in table two, the top one? One, two, three, four, five, six. And how many different alleles of D18S51 are there? One, two, three, four, that's the right side. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that that's biologically true, that just means in the table, this is true. There, as we just said, there could be additional repeat sizes 13 and beyond that don't show up in these tables. That's okay. Remember, if you ever think you have to make that sort of an assumption or you want to make an assumption on an exam, just write down what your assumption is and I will grade the answer according to what you're saying you're assuming. So you could answer this and say, well, assuming that all of the data is shown, then the answer would be there are six CSF1P0 alleles in four, D18S51 alleles. So how many different combinations can there be? You multiply them together. And for example, that's because there could be, for every CSF1P0 allele seven, it can be in combination either with whatever allele number that is, allele 9 at D18S51, or allele 10, or allele 11, or allele 12. For every CSF1P0 allele, there are four different combinations at this second marker. You do that six different times, second time, third time, fourth time, fifth time, sixth time. Each of those has four different combinations. 
which is a total of 24 different combinations. How many different combinations are there of VWA alleles and D18S51 alleles? Four. There's only one allele at VWA shown. So it's either going to be inherited with, we're talking haplotypes here, by the way, combinations of alleles. There are four different possible haplotypes. Now, some discriminating student in the audience has surely figured something out that's wrong with the VWA data. There's literally only one. There's only one allele, and... It's less than 1%. It's at 0.2%. So where are the other 99.8% of data? Gone. Yeah, I don't know. But they're not there. So that's why this seems like a really... It is a rare allele, but what the other alleles are, we're not told. That was, if this happened on an exam, then yes, that would be fine. You could say, I chose to answer my question based on table one or table two. Normally on exams, I'm more careful about writing all the stipulations of questions. For the mock exam, I was a little bit, I was playing loose a little bit. I wasn't specifying the wording quite as accurately as I would on an exam. Sure. Let's go. Um,